the a7s3 is this a little bit of overkill for vlogging i don't know we'll talk about it today along with now that I've had this camera for a few months, some of the things that I really like about it and a couple of little things that I don't like about it, but mostly it's everything I like about it, so. Well, hello there, and thanks for clicking on this video. I'm the Tactical Traveler, just a straight shooter who tells it like it is. I make gear reviews and comparisons on my channel for gear that I've personally bought or rented with my own money. I don't take free stuff. I don't get borrowed things. I don't have affiliate links that I'm trying to get you to buy stuff that you don't need. I started this channel because I was frustrated with all of those things that I saw on most tech reviews and I was trying to look for stuff. I ended up buying things that I didn't need. The reviewers were a little less than honest. I don't ever tell you what's better or worse. I tell you my experience with it, tell you some things that I like and dislike about it, and you make the decision on what's best for you. With that said, let's get into today's video. So I guess the first things first, we should discuss today's setup. Obviously the A7S III using the Tamron 17 to 28 f 2.8 lens, the ideal lens for this. Currently at 17, got the Rode Wireless Go going right into the A7S III. And we're in aperture priority shooting an S Log 3. So hopefully that took care of that. I have active steady shot on right now. I may do some shots with Catalyst Brows just to see how much better it is. And right now, I'm just hand-holding the camera. Uh, no tripod or anything whatsoever. I've got my little Manfrotto pixie grip, but I don't know that it really makes that much of a difference. So going for ease of use, we're just hand-holding right now. So that takes care of the setup. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to bring an ND filter. So all of you purists that will notice my motion blur is not right. It's because I'm an aperture priority. But honestly, if I was using the camera like this, for vlogging, I probably would uh, would use aperture priority anyways. Although, you know, it's not going to be perfect motion blur. But that's not what this video is about. It's just about what I like and dislike. And it's mostly about what I like because I'm becoming such a Sony fanboy. You probably all think I'm a Sony fanboy already. That's not really true, but I, I can see why you'd think that though. One of the cool things about using the wireless Go versus using a uh, shotgun mic that would be right here on the camera is, you know, wearing the wireless go right here, I can do shots like this and the audio quality is not going to be diminished because I, I'm not facing the camera this way. About me being a Sony fanboy, I could see how you'd think that, but in reality, I was a Canon fanboy for a very long time. I mean, I was so much of a Canon fanboy that a lot of times I felt like I wanted to, to make fun of other camera users, like they don't have dual pixel autofocus and they don't have you know, the Canon color science. And yeah, that was just kind of like very close minded to be such a fanboy. And what I noticed is while I was using Canon cameras and trying to improve my craft, all of the footage that I liked, all of the creators that I followed, they all used Sony cameras. And then all the images I liked and all the looks I was trying to emulate were all shot on Sony cameras. So at one, at some point I decided like, mm, you know, your, your snobbery is stupid. You just are like, oh, it's Canon or nothing. Well, how come you like all the Sony stuff then? So I took a leap and tried Sony and I was, I've been happy ever since. But at the same time, if I find myself doing the same thing, I'm just, I stay open-minded about this stuff. If I see other cameras, like I've been very intrigued lately about the Blackmagic stuff, their Pocket 6K, it's got me very intrigued very very intrigued but I already was somewhat invested in e-mount glass so I decided to go with the a7s3 even though it was a little more expensive once you outfit everything that you need on the on the uh, black magic with the batteries and the the cage and the lenses everything it was about the same price as, as this a7s3 but just a lesson don't be a fanboy I know I seem like a Sony fanboy I'm not I just use Sony right now but I'm always on the prowl, always keep my eyes open for the next best thing, and it doesn't necessarily have to be Sony. So let's talk about what I like about this camera. What, what are my favorite features? Well, I think it goes without saying, first and foremost, the best part of having this new a7S III is the image quality. It looks amazing, the, the images I get out of this camera. Now, I've switched cameras before, even when I switched from Canon to Sony, and then within the Sony lineup, I switched cameras a few times always expecting to see a 
an exponential increase in image quality and it just never happened. Even switching from Canon to Sony, I felt like I got more for my money when I switched to Sony. More features were, were in the cameras. It wasn't crippled like the Canon cameras were. However, I didn't see like a major increase in any sort of image quality. This camera, was the first time I bought a new camera, that there is a significant, I mean significant increase in image quality. Might be because this is my first 10-bit camera. I've always shot 8-bit footage. That, that could be a big part of it or it's just that good. I mean, it's, it's just a major improvement in quality. That's, that's number one. And number two, I don't know if this is gonna end up being number two, but and another reason, number two, <laughs> is the ease of use. And again, this might be because I've been in the Sony ecosystem for a little bit and I'm, I'm comfortable with it, but I just feel like to get a good image out of this camera versus to get a good image out of my a7 III, this camera is just easier. I just feel like, I'm capable of getting better images with less work out of this camera. And that brings us to the, to the next thing. It's the menu system. So the menu system is, is different than any other Sony camera. And now I gotta say, when I first started using it, I didn't really like it. And I'm not really, I guess it's because you're used to one men menu system, which kind of brings me to that whole, when I switched from Canon to Sony, I hated the Sony menus and I was like, oh, this is what everybody talks about. These menus suck. In reality, it was because I wasn't used to them. It was, I got used to the, the previous Sony menu system and kind of like it. So when I got this camera, I wasn't really a fan of this new menu system. I hardly even use the touch screen, but it's nice to have. I still do everything with my, the scroll wheel and, and all that stuff, but it's nice to have the touch screen. I just, I'm trying to get used to using it more. But now that I'm using this menu a little bit, I do like it. It is definitely a little bit more intuitive, makes a little bit more sense, but it's not like the end all be all, like it's not the greatest thing ever. The other menus were fine. I don't know why everyone hates on menus. Anytime you switch from Canon, Sony, Fuji, whatever you use, the menus are gonna be different. It's gonna be hard to figure out. Sony's got some weird labels on their stuff and they still have that in this one. It's not that big of a deal that they change menus. It just, I mean, it's prettier. It looks more intuitive, I guess. The camera that I've liked the menu the least on was Fuji. I couldn't tell what the hell I was doing on those things. I, I have to try again. Maybe I'll rent an X-T4 and do a comparison with this camera. And of course the ZV-1. Subscribe to see that one. So I don't know if I've said yet, but this is the first time I've kind of taken this camera out for a proper vlog test. While I didn't buy this camera specifically for vlogging, blah, vlogging, that's hard to say. It's certainly capable very capable camera for that but it's a bit overkill in my opinion I, I don't think if all you do is vlog and you have a youtube channel that you need to spend the money on this and if you've got the money and it's, it's within your budget and it doesn't make your family have to eat ramen noodles and hot dogs for a month go for it man but you know you do pretty good i've done a lot of comparison videos with the zv1 versus this camera, the a7C, the a7 III, the iPhone, the a6400, check all those videos out because I think the ZV-1 bang for the buck is a pretty good uh, option for vlogging. Now, it's not without its flaws, and I talk about that in all those videos and compare it, but I think it's a pretty good bang for the buck for most people. Another thing I do like about this camera is the uh, choice of media that you have the option to record with SD cards or those uh, uh, CF Express Type A cards or externally to the Atomos Ninja. Uh, really, really good move there by Sony doing that. And I'm probably gonna make a video in the future and definitely comment down below if you'd want me to, to kind of simplify the whole SD card thing of what you need. I mean, there's, there's plenty of videos out there that explain it, but almost like, I just feel like I could I don't know if I could explain it better, but I think I could simplify it. Just this card, you can do this. This card, you can do this. I, I, let me know if you want me to make that. But I do like that Sony gave a lot of options for media in this. You don't have to buy those expensive CF Express Type A cards to get 99.9% .9 of the function out of this camera. If you go down and buy the, the V90 cards, which are relatively expensive. They're about a dollar a gig. So 128 gigabyte cards, about 130 bucks, um, depending on the manufacturer. But you can, you can do stuff with the V90s. You can do 99% of everything. You can go with a V60 card. 
and you just lose a little bit more, but you still get a lot of features out of it. My old Sandus Extreme Pro cards that were just the regular, they weren't the UHS-2, they work in this camera too, and you can record most, th most things with that. I, I mean, don't quote me on exactly what you can record in it, but I know you can record 4K at least up to 60 on those. So uh, that's, uh, I should probably make a video explaining that, but one of the things I like in summary of this one thing is the wind is in my face. That's one thing I don't like, but the thing that I do like is the, the media choices. You've got a lot of choices with SD cards on this camera, and I think Sony really did the right thing on that, and they made this camera accessible to, to everyone. I mean, you already have to spend a lot of money to buy this camera, but at least you don't have to then buy a $400 memory card to make it work. That's, they could have got us on that one. They could have really got us, and they didn't. Thank you. So, what do I dislike about this camera? Man, that's a tough one. There's not much to dislike about it, I guess. I mean, maybe because it's only 12 megapixels, but I feel like there's a need for that because it works better in low light with the, the larger pixels versus the smaller pixels. I mean, if I could have my wish, I would want this same performance that you get out of this camera with a higher megapixel count so I could also use it for uh, photography and not have to worry about if I have to crop. That would be, I mean, that's an unrealistic thing. I mean, that just isn't how sensors work. Maybe Sony needs to invent a dual sensor camera. How about that? I just thought of that. Canon has dual pixel. Our dual pixels are because we have two sensors here in the Sony cameras or whoever. Canon can make it a dual sensor camera, one with a 12 megapixel sensor inside and it's like a sensor shift technology. I'm coming up with things. God, why don't they hire me at these companies? I mean, I don't know how to invent this, but it could have two sensors, switches between them, one for video, one for photo, and it has to be small. It's got to be the size of the ZV-1, but full frame, um, interchangeable lenses, and yeah, I thought of something I don't like about it. So the other thing I don't like about this camera is um, everybody loves the doors on the side, how the uh, the HDMI, the, the doors, how they open. They're better than the a7 III, I'll give you that. But I wish that you could remove them completely because they're kind of in the way when they're all open. I wish that they, I think about how my Osmo Action, how the little door for the USB-C slot, it opens and then you can like kind of take it off. It would be nice if these doors came off completely and so you could store them. I mean, you might lose them, but at least you'd have that option so you don't have all those doors sticking out. I always feel like I'm going to break one of those off when they're all open and I've got a lot of stuff stuck in there. I guess that's something I don't like about it. I knew there was something. I don't like that. Um, what else do I not like about it? I don't know. I mean, I can talk about some things I think are a little overhyped. I think the low light performance is incredible, but I mean, you're still going to have noise if you're try and video in the dark I mean yeah the camera does well you can see I took this thing it's a ZV-1 I took it in the backyard and like pitch dark and I mean it's dark it's still noisy let's be realistic it still needs it needs light any camera sensor does although it performs well in low light better than most now I'm not saying you're not gonna be able to see better in low light but you're it's not gonna be clean in the dark like night vision even night vision I use night vision in my former life and night vision is noisy even, I mean, I had the latest technology as of 2019 and, you know, with the white phosphorus in that, it's still, there's some noise. There's noise in those things with the latest tubes and everything. So, you know, there's a limit to what technology can do in low light. Another thing I really love about this camera is the frame rates. Everybody knows that you, you know, you can shoot 4K 60 and 4K 120, but I never really knew how much of a difference it made. I've used my a7 III with 1080-60 and 1080-120, and it looked amazing. However, I'm, I'm telling you, it makes a big difference. A big difference in this camera. I didn't think I'd use it that much. I find that I use it a lot and really like it. Although those 4K-60 in the all-eye codec is 600 megabits per second. Woo, they'll chew up a card. They will chew up a card fast, so, you know use it wisely. And that also leads me to the next point that the 1080 looks really good in this. Let me switch to 1080 for a little bit. See if you even notice. We'll do it right here. I switched to 1080. 
24 frames a second in the XAVCS codec. So this is the 422 10-bit at 50 megabits per second in 1080p. I'll let you drink in this glory here. You can shoot this on any old card that you had. And I think this image looks pretty darn good. It's, it's surprising, very surprising how good this looks on this camera. It's much better than the 1080 looked on my a7 III. So let's switch now to the 1080 all-eye compression. I'll, I'll do that right now. Now I'm in 1080, 24 frames a second in the all-eye compression. So it's still 422 10-bit, but the bit rate went up to 89 megabits a second, which is kind of weird, but the other one was 50. This is at 89 megabits per second. Can you even tell a difference? I'll put a little side-by-side -side up here between these two uh, shots. You got the other guy and you got me. Can you tell a difference between this in all I and that in XAVCS? This is SI, that's S. Is it noticeable? And you know what, I'll do the same thing. I'm gonna stand right here and we're gonna do the 4K as well. So over here, this is XAVCSI in 4K standing right here. And that's the difference that you get in 4K. This is 1080, that's 4K. Can you tell a difference? Is it that noticeable in the, the two images, especially when it's uploaded to YouTube? Can you tell? Let me know uh, in the comments down below which one do you like better and if you can even tell a difference between these two once it's gone through YouTube's compression. And I'm upscaling the whole video, uploading it as 4K to YouTube, so they compress it a little bit less. Okay, now a 4K guy gets to, to have the, the next word here. I'm in 4K. This guy over here, whatever side that is for you, I don't know. You're right, left, we'll figure it out, that guy. That guy over there, he's in 4K60. He's a little slow. He's definitely slow. He's kind of, I mean, I call him Forrest Gump. He's a little slow, but he's, he's definitely, you know, he's, he's moving. He not, not, he's got a friend that's even slower, but, but let's just talk to him now. This guy in 4K right here, 4K60 frames a second. And, you know, he's put on a 24P timeline, so he's slowed down to 40%. How's he look? And then, all right, now, this, this guy is, I mean, makes Forrest Gump look like he's quick-witted. This guy right here, this is his other friend. He's, he's 4K, 120 frames a second. We're just using the V90 cards on this, so he's slow. He is slow and a little weird, but, you know, his quality. Is the quality diminished significantly from where I'm at right here? This is the 240 megabits per second 4K all-eye codec. That guy over there is uh, in the XAVCS codec, which is a lower bit rate and still 10 bit, but he's slow. He's definitely, I'm sorry about that. I, I don't even know what he's doing. It's weird. It's weird. So this guy, he's in 1080, 240 frames a second. What do you think? I mean, he's not moving real fast, but he gets the job done. So bottom line, this is a phenomenal camera. I forget that I have 240 frames a second a lot of times, so I probably that's like the, maybe the second time I've even tried it or used it. I gotta remember to use it. It's a little, um, I wouldn't say confusing, you just have to kind of get used to it. So when you're in 4K all eye, like I'm recording it now, and you switch to the S and Q mode, it's gonna tell you you have to have a faster card. That's where you gotta have the, the CF Express Type A. So you gotta go and change to HD, XAVCS, and then it opens up a lot of options for your S and Q mode all the way up to 240 frames a second. So you could still do it. I probably need to just make a separate video on that to explain it because that was the one thing that I found a little bit confusing when I got this camera, was just figuring all that stuff out. But now that I figured it out, I mean, it's, it's amazing. And I never did do Catalyst Browse today, but that's okay. Maybe we'll do one, I'll do one quick clip to tell you goodbye with Catalyst Browse so you can 
see how that software straightens stuff out. This is my Catalyst Browse test. I had to turn off any stabilization in the camera. We'll let, we'll let Catalyst Browse do this. It's going to take a second, so hope you like it. Let me just say, if you made it this far, you got to see Catalyst Browse. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Check out all my other videos where I test different gear against each other. I don't ever take free stuff. I don't have affiliate links to try and get you to buy crap you don't need. Just am what I am. Just tell you what I think. If you like it, give it a thumbs up. If you don't like it, you can...